All right, hello friends. We will start soon. We see you coming in. If a part if an attendee could let me know in the chat box they can hear and see me, that would be great. Thank you. We'll get started in just a moment. Thank you. And welcome. And we also welcome our friends from YouTube. Our YouTube viewers, welcome. And in the chat box, you'll see a link that I put in that will have resources from tonight's chat. And as soon as we get going and the presentation starts, I'll continue to update those notes. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. My voice is a bit soft. I'll project a little bit more. No resources posted. Let's try that again. And here's that chat box link. There you go. And welcome, YouTube viewers. Hello. You could type where you're from tonight. That would be fun too. And if you know what native land you are residing on, you could do that as well. All right. We're going to jump in and get started on our intro because there is a lot to talk about and I'm going to keep it really brief so we can get on with the show. Welcome tonight. You are here to see Frida and the DeYoung uh, presenting Frida Kahlo. Appearances can be deceiving. But first, some really quick library um, info. For sure, the census is ending tomorrow. So please make sure you get that taken care of. Um, if you know friends and family and neighbors that haven't taken it, please let them know how important it is. It can bring in $20,000 um, for lots of community services uh, for each count. So it's really important. Lots of data is based on this. And, you know, it's an act of resistance and it's an act of activism, activism to take your census. So please make sure you get it in last night, last night. Um, this event is on SFPL's YouTube and will be there after this. By the way, I'm Anissa. I am your librarian host tonight. And we thank you so much for being here and joining us on the unceded land of the Yoloni Rangatush tribal groups who we acknowledge as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we reside. And that link is lots of documents towards um, indigenous culture and a site called Native Lands that I really like where you can put in your location and it'll tell you where, what lands you are occupying. We also wanna let you know we stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and there's also lots of resources in that list as well. Yay, done, voted and census, love it, thank you. Um, it is VIVA, which this event is part of, so sfpl.org slash VIVA for all of our events. And this is going to be a super breeze through. It is our On the Same Page uh, community read. Check that one out. Benjamin Boxiera, Mission District artist Calixto Robles joins us twice to show his art and to give us a history of um, Day of the Dead. This event will be in Spanish. Come practice your Spanish, come enjoy. If you already speak Spanish, enjoy everybody. Um, tomorrow, Chinatown 
uh, Dick Evans, amazing photographer, and Kathy Leong. And now just added to this lineup, Ben Fong Torres will also be in combo. And Ben Fong Torres is um, fame from Rolling Stone magazine. Yes, I'm sorry, there is a lot of background. There's children playing outside. What can you do? Welcome to the Zoom world. We're part of Bay Area Science Fest, check that out. Um, continued Poets, so many events, sfpl.org. Check out all of our events coming up. Well, one back, Angela Davis will be in conversation with Isaac Julian, must come to that one. And our One City, One Book, Know My Name, Chanel Miller. Take your senses. SFPL to go, place your holds, contactless pickup. Wear your mask, keep wearing your mask, protect my library family and all of our wonderful, beautiful people that work in the streets daily. Vote. Thank you, friends of the San Francisco Public Library for all that you do to support us. If you aren't a friend member, check out their social media, check out their membership. It has its privileges. And tonight we are so excited um, to have with us the De Young Museum for this special event. Um, we will have a QA and a uh, at the end. So save those questions, put them in the question and answer box. There's also going to be a survey tonight, which I will also put in their chat box and you'll get an email follow-up from me as well. So tonight we are so lucky to have the De Young Museum and this is part of their virtual art talks uh, featuring docent um, speakers. Um, Frida Kahlo's exhibit uh, returns to San Francisco after 90, 90 years after her first visit to the city. This exhibition examines how politics, gender, trauma, sexuality, and national identity influenced her diverse modes of creativity. The exhibition paints an intimate portrait of the artist through a trove of personal items which came to light in her lifelong home in Mexico City. Items including photographs, clothing, jewelry, and a personalized orthopedic brace from the Kahlo Museum in Mexico City is all on view along with paintings, drawings that span Kahlo's entire life. I cannot wait to go. I'm so excited. Um, tonight we have Catherine Zupsik, um, who is an art educator, has been an art educator for over 25 years, and has been a docent and lecturer for the Santa Barbara Museum of Art the De Young Museum, Legion of Honor, and SF MoMA. She has given hundreds of presentations to adults and students in the Bay Area, and now heads up the Virtual Art Talks program at the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. A native of Portland, Catherine has a degree in Spanish Latin American literature from the University of Oregon and has a graduate, and is a graduate of Laverne, 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 ooh, Chef School in Paris. Um, love it. So Catherine, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to stop sharing and it's all you. Great. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk about this exhibition that has been hanging on the walls of the De Young since March, since mid-March, and finally was able to open. Um, I think it was last week. So just bear with me a second while I share my screen. Whoops, sorry. Okay, excuse me. Well, um, apparent Frida Kahlo appearances can be deceiving will be on view at the De Young through February 7th. 
Frida Kahlo has become such an incredible icon in our time. I think most people in the United States would recognize this image as Frida Kahlo, even though all we see here is a hairstyle and a set of eyebrows. She has become the most recognizable female artist in the world, living or dead. And uh, her, her fame and popularity has now surpassed that of her famous husband, Diego Rivera. But this actually has um, scholars and art historians a little bit concerned because her popular image has so completely overtaken the reality of the complex woman and artist that she was. So this is a nice thing about this exhibition at the De Young because it brings to light new information about Frida Kahlo. It comes from the Casa Azul or Blue House in Mexico City. This is the house where Frida was born, lived most of her life, and she died there in 1954. It's now a museum, one of the most popular attractions in all of Mexico City, and it's kept exactly the way it was when Frida lived there. When Frida died in 1954, her famous husband, Diego Rivera, requested that all of her personal items be locked away in a series of closets in the Casa Azul. This was Diego Rivera's bedroom, and that green door is one of the doors that was locked. And for a variety of reasons, these things remained locked up for a period of 50 years. It was only in 2004 that the museum staff finally was able to unlock these doors. And what they found was astonishing. There were more than 6,000 photographs and personal documents of Frida and Diego's. Most of the photographs had never been seen before. And there were all of Frida's costumes, her iconic costumes that we know so well from her uh, paintings and from photographs of her, along with her hair ornaments, jewelry, makeup, and other personal things. So these are some of the things that will be on view at the De Young, along with a very good selection of her paintings, paintings that span her entire career. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is Frida Kahlo, her life and her art, and I'm going to use the objects from the De Young exhibition as illustrations as we go. One of the very most important things to understand about Frida Kahlo is that she came of age in the years following the Mexican Revolution. The revolution started in 1910 because this man, Porfirio Diaz, had been president for 31 years. And while he had modernized the country, he had done so by favoring a tiny elite group of Mexicans and foreigners. While the majority of Mexicans were lived in poverty and only 85% of the population could read. So in 1910, the people in the countryside had had enough. They rose up, they started rebel armies and fought in a bloody war that would last for 10 years. These are vintage photos of the Mexican Revolution. These are soldiers from the state of Oaxaca in the South. And I want you to look at the women seated on the ground. They are wearing these shawls called rebosos, which they have made themselves by hand on wooden hand looms. I'm telling you this because we're going to see Frida Kahlo wearing these a lot later on. So in 1920, the rebels won the revolution and established themselves in the seat of government in Mexico City. And one of the new government's revolutionary ideas was that art would be an important part in unifying the country and, um, and in assisting a population that was largely illiterate. Uh, so they began a huge program of public murals on, on be beautiful, colorful murals on the walls around Mexico. The first thing they did was get in touch with Diego Rivera, who was living in Europe. He'd been painting in Spain and France for 15 years with people like Pablo Picasso, but they convinced him to come back to Mexico and paint murals. So this is an example 
of one of Diego Rivera's murals. Uh, we see men, workers, laborers going down into the mines. He is expressing a new revolutionary idea that was called Mexicanidad, that means Mexican-ness. So the idea for the first time that art in Mexico should be about Mexico and about Mexicans, that culture should be about Mexicans. Whereas before, um, under this ruling elite, it had really been uh, only art from Europe or cult the European culture, which was, was what was so revered. So here's more of Diego's mural work uh, celebrating the indigenous cultures of Mexico for the first time. These groups had been ignored and Diego will celebrate their creativity and beauty. And for the first time, um, honoring the great magnificent civilizations of Mexico's past. Here, the Aztec city at Tenochtitlan. So Frida would be just starting high school when the revolution ended, and she would grow up with this great pride in her Mexican heritage. Look at what she's wearing. She is wearing a rebozo, the same as the impoverished ind indigenous women that we saw earlier. And she will come of age surrounded by artists, filmmakers, thinkers, who all come to Mexico City to make this new revolutionary art. This is called the Mexican Renaissance. So as I go on, please notice, see the little asterisk there. When you see one of those, it means that we're looking at something that will be in the exhibition. Frida Kahlo was born in 1907, but she would later lie about that and say that she was born in 1910 because she wanted to be able to say she was born the year the revolution started. This is a problem when you're researching Frida Kahlo. She would stretch the truth a lot about her life story. So you read a lot of conflicting um, versions of her life. Excuse me. These are her parents. It's their wedding photo. Her mother, Matilde Calderon, was from Oaxaca in the south. She was mestiza, which means of mixed indigenous and Spanish blood. Her father, Guillermo Calo, was actually European. His parents were Hungarian Jews who had migrated to Germany. And when he was a young man of just 18, he he crossed the ocean by himself and went to Mexico City to find his fortune. And he became a photographer for the government, documenting uh, government buildings around Mexico. He loved doing portraiture in addition to this, to his work and took lots of photos of his family. Here is his wife, Matilda, posing as a very cute woman of the revolution. And he took many pictures of his children, especially Frida, his favorite, because she was so smart and creative. So here you see her, she's very comfortable uh, posing for the camera, smiling for the camera. Here she's six years old. Now she's 12 years old, but Frida isn't smiling anymore. When she was six, she contracted polio and had to spend 11 months isolated in her bedroom. So she missed out on school, she missed out on friends. And when she went back, one leg was shorter and thinner than the other. And um, the kids teased her, she walked with a limp. They called her pata de palo, which means peg leg. Uh, and she would try to hide this leg with uh, layers of socks, but it didn't work. Um, the kids continued to tease her. She has said that she compensated for these troubles by becoming a character, a tomboy, the girl who was daring, who wasn't afraid to get in trouble, who was outspoken. And these are qualities that Frida would retain for her entire life. Uh, here you see Frida on the left, in the excuse me, on the right, in the little sailor suit. That's her sister in the white dress on the left, her sister Christina, and in the middle, a friend. But notice how the girls have crossed their legs at the ankles. This is to Frida's benefit. She will hide, try to hide that one damaged leg behind the other leg for her entire life. 
here she is in high school and her father took lots of pictures of her. And I want you to really notice this pose. Her shoulders are facing forward, but her head is turned slightly to the side. So we have a three quarters view of her face. And this, this intense gaze is one that her father would capture a lot in Frida. I'm telling you this because we're going to see the exact same pose and the exact same gaze where she locks eyes with us in her later self portraits. Here's another photo taken about the same time. Can you find Frida? Look for her very short haircut. There she is. She surprised the family by appearing for the family photograph dressed as a man in one of her father's suits. And this points out a couple things about Frida. First of all, she loved posing. You can see she's taken this mannish pose in the photograph. She also um, would use her clothing to change or express her character throughout her life. And then there's something, there's this androgynous quality about Frida Kahlo, uh, which fits right in with that mustache and unibrow. Nobody in, in the 1920s or 30s, no stylish woman would have had thick eyebrows or a unibrow. Thin eyebrows were in style. This is what Frida said about herself. Of my face, I like the eyebrows and the eyes. Aside from that, I like nothing. I have the mustache and in general, the face of the opposite sex. But the thing is, she seemed to be just absolutely fine with this. She she had her own ideas about how she should look, and she always kept that eyebrow, those eyebrows and the mustache. Again, any stylish woman would have gotten rid of that mustache by any means possible, but not Frida. It was part of her unique identity throughout her entire life. Um, people said she would even make jokes about it when she stood up at a dinner party and said, excuse me, I have to go shave. For high school, Frida went to the National Preparatory School, which was the most, um, in, the best high school in all of Mexico. It was, um, she, when she started, they had just begun admitting girls. So it was a student body of 2000 with only 35 girls. And Frida was very smart. That's how she got into the school. She read voraciously, including difficult things like um, philosophy but she was not a good student. She was just interested in being a prankster. Her, her group of friends were wild and got in a lot of trouble. Even so, uh, what Frida wanted to do, her goal was to go to university and become a doctor. But fate intervened. When she was a senior in high school, she was riding home from school on the bus and it collided with one of these new modern trams you see here that were all over Mexico City. When she was thrown from the bus and when they found her on the ground, she a, a metal handrail from the bus had completely impaled her through the pelvis. She had broken her spine in three places. She'd broken that same right leg in 11 places, dislocated her foot, and there were many more injuries than that. The doctors did not think Frida would live. But she did survive, and this is a drawing, the only one she ever did of the accident. Uh, one of, this is one of the things that was found not too long ago in the Casa Azul. So above you see the bus and tram colliding, those bodies on the ground, and then Frida below on a stretcher bandaged up. Frida spent a month in the hospital and a year recovering at home. She did not return to high school. She never went on to university. She would suffer from intense pain in her spine and right leg for the rest of her life. And um, she, to her great dismay, she was never able to have children. She lived for 29 years after that accident. And in that time, she had 32 grueling surgeries, usually with long recovery periods. But 
it was the accident that set Frida on the path to becoming an artist. She said she never would have considered that before. Her mother um, had this special easel designed so that Frida could draw or paint while lying in bed. And they installed a a mirror on the inside of her canopy uh, on her bed so that she could look at herself and draw or paint, which is how she came to start making so many self-portraits. This is the first major painting she ever made. Um, she was still, you know, just just recovering from this accident. And she's painted herself in this seductive velvet dress because she's going to send this to her boyfriend who was ignoring her since that accident. Look at her face and pose. There it is, that same pose, that same intense expression in her eyes. She hasn't started wearing Mexican style clothing yet. That will come just a little bit later. Frida Kahlo met Diego Rivera when she boldly walked up to him while he was painting a mural. She interrupted him and asked him if he would look at her paintings, which he did, and they were married a year later. As you can see, they were a very odd couple. Frida, excuse me, Diego was 43 years old. Frida was 22. He was a very famous artist. No one had ever heard of her. He was enormous. He was over six feet tall and weighed more than 300 pounds. Frida was tiny, under five foot three and barely weighed 100 pounds. Her, her mother was just appalled at the idea of them getting married. She said, it's like an elephant marrying a dove. But you could see why Frida loved Diego Rivera. He was not only a great artist, but he was charming, brilliant, funny, um, and he appreciated Frida. He loved her unconventional mind and her crazy sense of mischief. They had important things in common. They were both from the middle class. They both um, were deeply devoted to the ideals of the Mexican Revolution, and would fight their entire lives for justice for the poor people in Mexico. They were both members of the Communist Party as well. This is their wedding photograph. They didn't have a big wedding. They just got married at City Hall. Frida, uh, here you see her, she did not wear a wedding dress. She said that this was a, a dress she borrowed from a maid at the last minute. And she's here smoking a cigarette in her wedding portrait. Look down at her feet, that awkward stance she has, that is that habit she has of trying to hide that one leg. After they'd been married exactly a year, um, in 1930, Frida and Diego came to San Francisco where he had been commissioned to paint two big murals. Frida went with him. This was very exciting for her. It was her first time out of Mexico, really pretty much her first time out of Mexico City. Um, so here he's sketching, making sketches for the murals while she looks on. She had lots of free time and was able to explore San Francisco, which she absolutely loved. She especially loved the neighborhoods and particularly Chinatown. She loved fabrics and interesting textiles. And she wrote home to her mother that the Chinese children were the most beautiful she had ever seen in her life. She and Diego lived downtown on Montgomery Street, right across the street from where the Transamerica Pyramid building is today. At the time, that was an artist colony of sorts. So Frida was surrounded by artists, and this is when she began to paint seriously. Frida, by the way, was self-taught. She took a couple art classes in her life, but she never did attend any kind of formal art school. So here you might recognize this painting. It's a it's part of the it's a centerpiece of the collection of SF MoMA. And she has depicted herself um, in Mexican clothing now. So you see she's wearing a reboso, a red reboso. Uh, she's wearing the colors of the Mexican flag, red and green a jade necklace or two around her neck. And then her hair is kind of indigenous style, braids wrapped in ribbon pinned to the top of her head. She has depicted 
Diego Rivera as the famous artist he was holding his brushes and palette and he is wearing a nice suit but underneath a workman's shirt and big miner's boots to uh she's depicting him this way of course to align him with the working class which was so important to him so look at their look at their relationship She's just 22 years old. Her, she, her head is leaning in sweetly toward him. But look at his head. Diego's head is turned away, as he will always be turned away, looking for other women and obsessed with his art. So she seemed to understand this already after just one year of marriage. Then above their heads in flies a bird uh, with this banner. And on the banner, it says, here you see me, Frida Kahlo, with my beloved husband, Diego Rivera. I painted these portraits in the beautiful city of San Francisco, California, for our friend, Mr. Albert Bender. And it was in the year 19, in month of April in the year 1931. The first time I realized what this said, I was really disappointed because I thought it would say something very personal or poetic, but she is taking this, this um, banner with just factual information from Mexican folk art. Uh, this is an example. This is called a retablo or ex voto painting, little paintings made on tin, very amateurish paintings. Um, so here you see a couple uh, out in a boat, they're lost at sea, and they're pleading with the Virgin Mary, who's just floating up there to rescue them. The caption underneath is just factual, not dramatic, just like Frida's. On the 20th of September, 1929, in the port of Veracruz, we were saved from shipwreck by praying to the Virgin. I dedicate this remembrance. So you can imagine why Frida would have been attracted to these, why she would be influenced by these. They're they're uniquely Mexican. They are folk art, the art of the everyday people of Mexico. And they're really about everyday events. Most of the Rey Tablo paintings depict people injured or ill in bed, but there's always that saint or here Jesus floating surreally in the sky. These are also about human suffering. And that's something that Frida would have understood very well. When she was in San Francisco, Frida started to understand the power of the way she dressed in, in Mexico City after the Mexican Revolution. It was not uncommon for a, a progressive, artistic pro young woman like Frida to dress in indigenous styles. But in San Francisco, in the United States, no one had ever seen anyone dress like this. So she attracted a lot of attention. Imogen Cunningham and Edward Weston, two famous San Francisco photographers, asked to take her picture. And Frida wrote a letter home to her mother, uh, very excited. She said, the gringas really like me a lot and pay, pay close attention to all the dresses and the rebosos that I brought with me. Their jaws drop at the sight of my jade necklaces. This is a clipping from the San Francisco newspaper. Diego Rivera was a huge celebrity and the press followed him everywhere he went. So here they have followed him and Frida to a Chinese restaurant where they're going to have dinner. So look at the two women standing next to Frida. Those are the styles of the early 1930s. And then look at Frida. You can just imagine what a stir she caused wherever she went. She, at one point, she had a little group of children following her saying, where's the circus? So what exactly is Frida wearing? She has taken, she is wearing a specific style of indigenous dress. There were many different indigenous groups, many styles of dress in Mexico, but she chose this one specifically. Uh, these are women, Tijuana women from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec there in the South. And they were very independent, strong women, which of course Frida would have liked. The outfit is consists of a long skirt with a big lace flounce at the bottom and then a loose fitting top. 
here Frida is wearing it. So she likes this outfit because it expresses, of course, her Mexican heritage of which she is so proud, but it also hides that leg. This with, because the skirt is so long and that loose fitting top hides the fact that Frida almost always had to wear some kind of a corset or even a plaster cast on her torso to shore up that, that damaged spine. These are some of the outfits that will be in the exhibition. If you get to go see the show, be sure and look closely because they have cigarette burns and food stains, um, splashes of paint, signs that she really lived in these clothing, these clothes. People who knew her said that it would take her over an hour to get dressed every day. It was This is part of her creative expression. She would put together these outfits very carefully with um, combining the colors and textures and patterns. Some of the clothes were handmade um, authentically in Tehuantepec, but a lot of them she just would have made in, in by tailors in Mexico City, often of imported fabrics or even synthetic fabrics. She would just mix it all up. As time went on, she became more and more flamboyant. Frida Kahlo did like being the center of attention. She liked being noticed. And so here you can see now she's wearing a lot of makeup on her face. She's painted her fingernails. She would often wear rings on every finger, lots of jewelry and elaborate hair ornaments. The fashion world did take note of Frida Kahlo. Here she appeared in a spread in vogue in 1937, and the great Parisian designer Elsa Schiaparelli designed this Madame Rivera dress in 1939. Notice it's not called a Frida Kahlo dress, it's Madame Rivera. She did not have her own individual identity um, at this time. Lots of the best photographs of Frida were taken by great fashion photographers. And this is my personal favorite because it shows her personality. People who knew Frida Kahlo said that she had a big, warm, generous spirit. She had, even though she was so tiny, she had this kind of hoarse voice and a deep infectious laugh. She was dramatic and passionate. She loved to use foul language. She could drink great big men under the table. She was fun and she was funny. She was very tender and loving with her family and friends and they adored her. She, they said that she always appeared happy in public and even in private. But appearances can be deceiving. That is the name of the exhibition. And that is the little caption you see written pa very palely in pencil in Spanish at the bottom of this drawing. This is another thing that was found in the Casa Azul. So here she shows us what's going on underneath that costume. She paints butterflies on her undamaged leg, but the other leg is scarred and thinner than, than the one with butterflies. And then we see these corsets that she had to wear all the time. A few of them will be in the exhibition. Here, um, she would usually paint them, decorate them. This particular one, uh, she's painted a column, a broken column to represent that spine of hers, which was so ruined. So this, this sets us up an interesting thing about Frida. Her public image and the way she would dress was all designed to, to hide what was really going on underneath. But her artwork will do the opposite. Her artwork will reveal her psychological and physical reality. Here we see her depicting her pain as nails sticking into her. She's wearing one of these, um, one of the corsets that will be in the exhibition, leather straps over, over metal braces. And it looks like that corset is all that is holding her together. 
Look at the landscape in the background. It mimics, uh, her, her broken body is mimicked in the landscape. Uh, you always want to look at the backgrounds in Frida Kahlo's paintings. And then, of course, we see her tears flowing down. But look at her face and her body. I mean, she is absolutely beautiful. Frida Kahlo will continue to depict herself as a sexual being right along with her disability. And this has made her a hero of the disabled community because she shows disability and sexuality simultaneously. They do not cancel each other out. She would allow the press to come into her bedroom. I mean, celebrities never do this while she was lying in bed. When she would become, be recovering from these um, surgeries, her casts would not allow her to sit up. So she literally had to lie down flat in bed. Here you see her decorating one of her corsets. And on the right, you see one of her communist corsets uh, casts with the hammer and sickle. But notice, look, at her. She's got rings on every finger, makeup, full makeup. She's wearing bracelets. Her hair is perfectly done. She would, she would dress in full costume every single day until the very end of her life, no matter how terrible she felt. And those last 10 years of her life were pretty miserable. Her frame was simply disintegrating. Even so, her friends, one of her friends said, you would go to visit Frida Kahlo to console her, but it was you yourself who would come away consoled. Eventually she had to have that right foot amputated and then the right leg um, from the knee down. And she did not live very long after that. She would die in 1954 at the age of 47. The cause of death was listed as a pulmonary embolism, but she had been taking so many painkillers, usually with alcohol, that she very well could have had an overdose, either accidental or intentional. So now I have a special treat, a couple very short, silent, home movies that give us a better idea of what Frida was really like. She, we see her in a very different light when, when we see her in motion. I particularly love the second little clip because you can tell that she just said something funny. So now we're, let's look at some of her paintings. Most of them I'll show you will be in the exhibition. And we're going to see that her clothing paid, plays an important role in her painting as well. This is Memory from 1937. It was part of a series she did about coming of age. So she stands there um, in the middle of the canvas wearing a contemporary dress from 1937, but she's flanked by two other dresses. On the left is her school uniform from childhood. On the right is a Tijuana style dress. And bizarrely, each dress has one arm that is reaching out to her, but she only takes the arm of the Tijuana, which is will be her choice as an adult. Um, she has something, some kind of sword or lance is piercing her through the heart and we see her that her heart lies huge swollen and bleeding on the beach and she has no hands there's something helpless about Frida in this painting she did not tell us what this painting meant she rarely did say what her paintings meant so we are left to decipher for ourselves the Two Fridas, her most famous painting, has kind of a similar theme. Um, again, we're seeing dresses. This is a large painting, by the way. Most of Frida's paintings are quite small. This one, uh, the figures are life-size, so it's very big. 
So there you see that Tawana Frida on the right, and then on the left, a Frida in European style dress. Remember, Frida was half European. Her father was from Germany. So um, she she always said that it was the this Mexican Frida that Diego Rivera loved. So she is holding, the Tijuana is holding a tiny thing. It's a miniature portrait of Diego Rivera. And from it comes an artery which winds up her arm attaches to her heart, reaches across to the other Frida and attaches to that heart. She cannot separate these two. That would mean death. They're holding hands and they're connected forever. After San Francisco, Frida and Diego went to New York City and Detroit, where he painted more murals. They were gone for a total of three years. And this is a small painting she made in New York City. Uh, you see the Statue of Liberty up there at the top, Manhattan, below that, the Stock Exchange. And then her Tijuana dress hangs on a blue ribbon suspended bizarrely between a toilet and a trophy. This is kind of Frida's sense of humor. She thought it was funny that Americans were obsessed with sanitation, the toilet, and sports, the trophy. But as much as she really liked New York, uh, she was very popular there. Uh, but she became so homesick that here she's painted her dress without herself even present in it. kind of a similar idea she painted when they were in Detroit. Here she stands in the middle again on the left hand side is her depiction of Mexico. Oh, you see the, the ancient pyramid there in the background with the sun and moon so important in Mexican ancient cosmology in Mexico. In the midground, um, ancient artifacts and in the foreground, plants, lush Mexican plants with those roots reaching way down into the soil. On the right hand side is her depiction of the United States. The important buildings in the United States are not ancient temples, they are modern factories and big skyscrapers, skyscrapers with no windows. Then in the midground we see those strange vents that look like they must be the human beings of the United States. And in the foreground, instead of lush plants, electrical appliances with cords instead of roots reaching down into the soil. Uh, this is her expression of her feeling that the United States had lost touch with its ancient heritage. So then again, she stands there in the middle looking really kind of rebellious. I mean, look at that dress. It's just, it just looks so unlike something she would wear, this pink frilly dress with these silly little gloves. And she's smoking a cigarette and has a little American flag. She said that this was the kind of dress she was expected to wear to society events in Detroit and where they thought everyone in in the movers and shakers in New York thought she was fantastic. Everybody in Detroit just, Detroit just thought she was kind of weird. So she would do rebellious things. She, Frida spoke English very well, but she had quite a thick accent. So at these parties, she would just pepper her speech endlessly with extremely obscene words. But then she would pretend that she didn't understand what they actually meant. Here she is making this painting. So you can see how small it is. Um, this is one of the time, few times that Frida was actually influenced by Diego Rivera because this actually looks like a mural. As small as it is, it has all of this information uh, going on in it. You should know that Diego Rivera was always encouraging to Frida about her art. From the day he met her, he thought she was a fantastic original artist and always supported her. Uh, even though he was the famous one, he would try to give her a little nudge forward whenever he could. So that was a good thing about Diego.
while they were in Detroit, Frida had a miscarriage. This was not her first miscarriage. That damaged pelvis just made it impossible for her to carry a pregnancy to term. This time she was four months pregnant. And so she has painted herself on a little piece of tin, just like those retablo paintings. You can see the similarity. She lies in bed, um, just looking so vulnerable naked, bleeding, not even a sheet to cover her and not even centered in the bed, kind of weirdly off center. And then this, this background, so cold and uncomforting. Uh, that's probably the Ford motor plant back there. And then instead of having a saint floating in the air, uh, Frida surrounds herself with things that had personal meaning to her. A miscarried fetus right above her. To the right of that, a snail, which she said represented how slow that miscarriage was, how long it took. And then below that, her, her ruined pelvis. Art critics and other artists at the time wanted to group Frida Kahlo with the surrealist painters. And you can certainly see why. Um, the surrealists were painting the subconscious mind, the stuff of dreams. But Frida didn't want to be grouped in with them. She always said, I am not painting dreams. I am painting my own reality. When they went back to uh, Mexico City, Frida would stay there essentially for the rest of her life. And she did some of her best portraits in this time, like self-portrait with cropped hair. She painted this when Diego Rivera asked her for a divorce. He had fallen in love with someone else and she did cut off all of her hair. Look at it writhing, how creepy it is down there on the floor. This is the hair that Diego loved. Look at what she's wearing. She's not wearing that Tijuana costume that Diego loved and which has been her identity. She's dressed in a man's suit. This is a portrait she made just a few months later when her hair had started to grow out. So she can't contain, she can't braid it well or contain it within the ribbons. It just has a, it's all different lengths. It has this life of its own. You see it up there kind of writhing on top of her head. What's she wearing here? She's covered up by leaves, but she is nude. So again, she seems to have, maybe she's finding some sense of autonomy at this time that she isn't with Diego. Uh, she is wearing this necklace that Diego had given her. She wore it all the time. It's an Aztec necklace, but here it kind of looks like a yoke around her neck especially with those strange green cords, almost like some kind of connectors uh, as well. She and Diego remained divorced for only one year. They would remarry um, back in San Francisco. Here they are signing the wedding, the marriage documents and notice the necklace that Frida is wearing. Frida, there were rules that Frida made before she would marry Diego again. And one was that the marriage would be celibate. She, it was just too painful to watch him fall in love with and run off with other women. Frida had many affairs too. She had affairs with men and women, but she, she always was devoted to Diego. She didn't actually fall deeply in love with other people the way he did. So here, look at this necklace a necklace of thorns showing her pain. And she's wearing a reboso, but she's turned it backwards. So it looks, and it's brown. So it looks like a celibate monk's robe. Then her earring is a hand. You know, we've kind of seen that amputated hand before. And it also refers to another form of Mexican folk art, milagros, which are little charms you would wear to aid with healing. She actually had owned a pair of these hand earrings. I think just, I think she lost one and just one of them is in the exhibition, but they were a gift to her from Pablo Picasso. 
the last painting I'm going to show you is this self-portrait where she's wearing another form of indigenous dress, uh, resplandor, this is called, this headdress, um, which literally means radiance. This is a photograph of her mother's family from the late 1800s. That's her mother down there as a child with a blue arrow pointing to her. And in the background, you see some of her aunts wearing this resplandor, which means it was a holy day um, in the Catholic church. She owned a resplandor. You see her wearing it, and there will be one in the exhibition. I have to tell you honestly that I really disliked this painting when I first saw it. That resplandor just looks so unlike something Frida would wear, so against her character. But over time, this has become my favorite painting of all the ones in the exhibition. She has painted that lace with so much care. It is so beautiful. And then look at the background. It's so similar in color and style to the lace that it doesn't look like she's wearing something quite as much as it looks like she's behind that canvas somehow looking through. Um, you can see that she is crying. We see her tears. Does that, the resplandor, it covers her hair. It looks like a nun's wimple. Um, is it tight around her face? It's simultaneously beautiful and worrisome. Here's a close up where you can see those tears. Uh, the tears refer to Catholic imagery of the sorrowful mother, which is images of the Virgin Mary grieving over the death of Jesus. But if you look at the Virgin, her nose and eyes are very red from crying, and she has a sorrowful expression as she, she looks down in sorrow. But Frida, no matter how much anguish she is expressing in a painting, her face always retains this mask-like lack of expression. Um, and that same exact intense gaze that her father captured in her portrait photograph when she was just 18 years old. So did Frida, um, did Frida become a famous artist? Did she sell paintings? There was a period in the 1930s that she was kind of the darling of the critics in New York, and she had a solo show and sold half the paintings in it. She had she appeared in a small exhibition of surrealist art in Paris at one point, and just before she died, there was a big retrospective of her art in Mexico City. But after she died, she was forgotten as an artist outside of Mexico. It would not be until the late 1970s that a group of Chicana artists in San Francisco in the Mission District at the Casa de la Raza would, would hold an exhibition honoring Frida Kahlo. And this that would begin this, this this rise to fame for Frida Kahlo. And today she is much better known, as I said, than her husband, Diego Rivera, and such an icon to so many different people for so many different reasons. So I'm going to finish by just showing you pictures of the third of her great forms of creative creativity, and that is the Casa Azul itself. Um, she filled it with art and artifacts. She created a beautiful garden full of beautiful Mexican plants and many animals, some of them wild animals. So this is one of my favorite portraits. Take a picture taken in the very last period of her life with an inscription up there in the left that says in Spanish, don't forget Frida. It's just heartbreaking that she would never know how unforgettable she would become to us. So I am going to just let you relax and look at these pictures of the Casa Azul along with some of the paintings she made in her garden there. Thank you. Para un pájaro a ver Después de picar la flora y petrona No quiso permanecer Después de picar la flora y petrona No quiso permanecer
I think Anise is going to come back in a second. We have time maybe for a, a, some questions. We have a few questions, and I'll definitely uh, give them to you, some, some of the ones that we probably don't have time for all, so we apologize. Um, in her painting itself, uh, is her painting itself considered important by art critics, or is she and what she was saying in her paintings considered to have more importance than the painting itself? Did you get that? I think I understand. I think I understand uh, the question, which is maybe it's about the, the technical form, uh, you know, uh, would it be considered great art uh, or is it more the extraordinarily original content of Frida Kahlo's painting? And I think it's, I th actually think it's both, but you know, she wasn't a trained artist. I mean, I, I don't think you could probably compare Frida's painting to um, one of the great technical artists of the world, but uh, because of the content, uh, that is what has made her famous and um, so original. Uh, two people ask, um, why was Frida's stuff locked up for so long? Why did it take 50 years? Was Diego behind it? No, Diego wasn't behind it. It was, a, I mean, and it's a complicated story. It was supposed to be locked up. He asked that it was locked up for 15 years, but then it went out, somebody else had control of the estate and it just, just a few things happened that, that it just remained locked up. Last, last one, I let's go for this one. Do you think Frida or Diego had any inkling or sense that their art and notoriety would be things more easily accessible and consumed by the bourgeoisie or upper class? If so, or if not, how would they view that? And if they were alive today, and if they were alive today? Oh, that is a really good question. Well, I mean, at the time, I think that Diego Rivera's art was very much about the working classes. I, I don't think, and it was on public, you know, it was public and on public murals. So it was intended then very much to be um, consumed by the working classes. Uh, I don't know if you could say it's more important to the bourgeoisie now. I, I, I just don't know. I don't know. Uh, Frida, however, was always, you know, she wasn't trying to be some big popular famous artist. She was, she was painting uh, privately most of the time for herself and for her friends, expressing herself. It was only at that time that they got divorced that she wanted to make money, she, that she became very interested in selling, in selling her paintings. Um, her paintings are so personal that they, to me, they just cross all boundaries. Thank you, Catherine. I'm gonna answer one technical question was, uh, will this be available closed caption? It will on YouTube generate a closed caption eventually. Um, and if anyone ever does need closed captioning, you can contact us. The link is always in the Zoom registration and we can set up that 
best to call us 72 hours in advance, call or email, and we can definitely set that kind of thing up. Um, I want to thank Catherine. I want to thank the De Young Museum, and I want to thank all of our friends for being here tonight. We love you. We miss you. De Young, thank you so much. What a wonderful um, event, and I can't wait to go see the exhibit. And thank you so much for hosting me. It's just delightful just knowing you're all out there. <laughs> thank yeah, you. You're all out here. All <laughs> And our YouTube viewers, we want to thank you too. You too. All right. All right. Good night, everyone. Good thank night. You.